Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our Caring for the Caregiver webinar on what is palliative and hospice care. Um, we are going to get started shortly. I'd like to um, first thank Sutter Health Memorial Medical for Center for collaborating and helping us put this webinar on today. Um, I would like to remind you that if you do have questions to please go ahead and write them in the chat box. We will be uh, monitoring that chat box and we'll be addressing your questions at the end of the presentation. Our presenter today is Ms. Christine Stewart. Um, Christine is the Director of Palliative Care as well as Pediatric um, Care Services for Community Hospice. Um, she's been with our organization for um, over 27 years and uh, is very well versed in both hospice and palliative care and is excited to be here today to share with you you um, the difference between palliative and hospice care and um, how those services can uh, benefit our community members. So at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Christine Stewart. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the chat box and we will um, address them at the end. This program is also being recorded and will be available on um, our website at the end of the day. Christine? Thank you. Good morning, I'm Christine Stewart, as Kristen said, and we're going to talk about what is palliative and hospice care. Let me see if I'm getting this straight with the little tabs here. Just click on it. Oh, there we go. Palliative care, let's give a definition. Palliative care is specialized medical care for people with a serious illness. Palliative care focuses on relieving symptoms, and stress of a serious illness. The goal is to improve their quality of life for both the patient and for the family. We look at the whole group, patient and family. What is required in regards to the, you know, the progression of an illness? A person gets diagnosed with a chronic illness or serious illness, and it can go on for many years. But things can move along with time, and so for, for palliative care, you can be on the program for longer than other programs such as hospice, which I will get into that later, giving the comparison of the two. With hospice, it's usually there's a prognosis of six months of life or less for Medicare guidelines to be on services. With palliative, we don't have to go by that regulation. It's that you have a chronic and serious illness that you need assistance with managing that, that, that care, that diagnosis. Let's go to the next one. The core principles of our services are specialized medical people with a serious illness. We'll go over that at the end, but I will still tell you that it, it's a, you have a RN and a social worker and a medical director, and then we add to the team based on the needs of the person. We do uh, relieve pain, stress, and other symptoms other, and any other stages of an illness. Palliative care can be provided along with treatments. Unlike hospice, hospice is part of the whole group, the whole the whole body, mind, and soul. With palliative, we get to be, come alongside of you while you're still with home health, physical therapy, occupational therapy, chemotherapy, radiation, blood transfusions. We come and join on with you on your, on your road to that, um, separate from hospice. Understanding what constitutes a serious illness. So let's talk about that. Life-changing things. Um, it impairs your, the function of what you're able to do interferes with your normal activities of daily living, such as maybe taking a shower, uh, getting yourself to the bathroom by yourself, going to the grocery store, um, remembering about your doctor appointments, getting to your doctor appointments. With your illness, a serious illness, you can be at high risk for decline. Um, right now, you know, we're going through a pandemic and that puts people at risk also um, because of their other comorbidities. Serious illness, you are generally pretty frail or you can be with your diagnoses. Um, you're likely to um, receive non-beneficial care in the last year of your life. Ability to care for yourself or others is affected. So you might be a caregiver yourself, but once you get a serious illness and it starts to take life-changing impairments on you, then this affects the ability for you to care for others or for children or for elderly, for parents possibly. Um, and then there becomes a caregiver burden in regards to maybe people that weren't caregivers before now need to be your caregiver and assist with you. And so the whole dynamics of your family can change. And when palliative care gets involved, we come, like I said, alongside of you and help you with those, those uh, obstacles to overcome. 
and the caregiver also, they're part of the team. General eligibility for criteria for, um, for palliative care. Um, one thing is oftentimes the palliative patients, before they come on services, they are likely to use the hospital or the emergency rooms as, um, as their disease advances. So what happens is they become, they start using the emergency rooms more like a, a clinic, which is not the purpose of an emergency room. When you have palliative services, the team's able to come and see you. We're home-based. We come and see you at your home or where your location is, and we assist you with your pain management, your symptom management. We work on preventing you from going to the hospital to emergency visits. Much more efficient for you, saves on time and energy for you because your energy starts to change with your advanced illness. Um, let's see. The other thing, this is not a guideline, but the one thing that is talked about with a progressive illness and a serious illness is that it wouldn't be unlikely if there was a death was to occur within a year of life, of the, of the next year of your life because of your progression of your illness. But if you go past that year, you can still remain on the palliative program. Um, let's see, not in reversible acute uh, decompensation of a state. That's when the, the systems have already started to change that we can't go back to making them be repaired. They're, they're in progression of their disease. Attempt is appropriate in in-home disease management. Yes, we do attempt to appropriately do disease management. We still work with your physicians. Um, yeah, we work with your physicians and it can, it can be your specialists. It can be your uh, primary care physician, your attending physician, which would any and all of your physicians that see you, we work with them, we contact them. We encourage you to go to your appointments. We explain, we do a lot of educating. We explain to you why you go to certain specialists, what their purpose is, say maybe a pulmonologist. Why do you see a pulmonologist? That's for lung disease. Why do you see a nephrologist? That would be for kidney disease. So we help do educating along the way. Um, what another, this is very big in regards to um, palliative care is we assist with advanced care planning. Why is that important? Well, when you get to the point like right now, you'd be able to say, I can say, well, I can tell you what my, my wishes are, my desires, whether I want to be resuscitated, whether I don't, whether I want a feeding tube or not, um, who I want to speak on my behalf. If something happens to that person, who's the next person that I want to speak on my behalf? Well, something could change in, in a nanosecond. And if I don't have that documented down and my doctors know about it, then it's by the luck of the draw of kind of who it falls to. And this way, it really takes any of the worry and guessing out of it for your family and your loved ones when you've made that decision and you go through the advanced care planning. So we work on that with our patients and the families about doing the advanced care planning. And we strongly recommend that. And we talk about the pulse also with that. So what might this look like with palliative care? Well, what the team does is we provide, like I said, we have a social worker, so you get emotional support. Um, we work with helping you understand the condition of your illness. We work with, of course, always providing comfort to you based on whatever your goals of comfort are. And we determine goals of care and advanced care planning, like I said. And when I talk about the advanced care planning in regards to doing CPR or not doing CPR, intubating, being intubated for breathing, doing a feeding tube, all of those, you can, you can dial in on each one and make your specific choices on those. And we assist with that, we educate you with that. So when you go to do that paperwork, you're with clear decision of what, you, what you're signing up that you're wanting your wishes to be. Something that people ask is, well, what if I put that down on my paper and then I change my mind? You can always change your mind, but it's good to at least have a start with it in the advanced care planning. So then it's, it's just, you know, it gets people going into knowing your family, knowing what your wishes are, along with your physician. Where is palliative care provided? That's a good question. We go to um, private homes. We go to residential care facilities. Uh, we go to skilled nursing facilities. Um, we also can meet you at your clinic or your doctor appointments. In regards to the, the frequency of the visits, the care is based on your acuity. And what does acuity mean? It means your, your level of ability to perform things, whether you're able to get out or not, how high your needs are. So we make personal visits. Um, and like I said, now, because we're in this COVID era, we also do a lot of telephone visits, which is called telephony. Um, and that's quite amazing for people so that they don't have to get out of their homes. They don't have to be worried about other people's germs. It's just right there between, like this video is today, in regards to doing um, telephone conference calling, televisits. Our program is home-based, so we, you know, for the most part, our patients are at their homes. 
So now let's talk about hospice. What is hospice? Hospice is not a place, but it's a philosophy. Hospice focuses on each person's unique wholeness, um, taking into consideration their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs, and then developing a plan of care that is specific for them. The way I like to explain about hospice, hospice is like an all-inclusive, like a vacation where you go and you pay one price and it takes care of everything. Well, that's the way hospice is. It, it's all inclusive. It takes care of everything. Mind, body, and soul, all of the services that you need, and they do pain and symptom and comfort management also. But there's differences between that and palliative care. Patients that are appropriate for hospice, as I mentioned earlier, they when you come to hospice, you have to have a terminal illness, not a serious or chronic illness. They can be that, but then they turn, if it turns into something that becomes terminal, then it transitions to that terminal illness. And our Medicare guidelines say it has to be a prognosis of six months of life or less. That's one of the things that are appropriateness for a hospice patient. That doesn't mean that if you get onto hospice services and you live past the six months that you're discharged. What that means is every time the nurse is making their visit, they're assessing you to see that you still continue to be appropriate for the services. So you can remain on services for as long as necessary in regards to if you still qualify. Um, another qualification is that there's a declining um, functional status. We talked about that with the, with the palliative patients. They don't generally decline as quickly. They're usually up and about quite a bit. Hospice patients, we have what we call a PPS, a palliative performance scale, which has to do with those things of, of daily living, like I said, about showering, bathing, going to the grocery store, going to the doctor appointments by yourself, driving. A lot of those things start to change for the hospice patient. Um, alteration in nutrition, that's a very big one. Um, a lot of times our patients come onto services and they've lost greater than 10% of their body weight over the past six months, or they're currently losing weight um, because their eating habits have changed. There's lack of, of hunger, um, there's nausea and vomiting. There's all sorts of reasons why nutrition status changes. Um, observable, uh, an observable and documented deterioration in overall clinical condition is in the last past four to six months. So what we do is when we get a referral for hospice, is we get your medical records with your permission that you're wanting services, we get them from your physician, we review those records, which helps build the case in regards to your diagnosis to, be, to come onto our services. And you need to have at least one of the, of the following. Um, multiple hospitalization or ER visits, that's very common when things start to escalate, what do you do? You want help, you go to the ER, you want help, you go to the ER, you don't feel good, you go to the ER. Something doesn't seem right, you've had radiation and chemo and just it's stopped and you just don't feel right, you've gone to the ER. Um, decreasing your tolerance of physical activity. You know, it might be too much of an um, ordeal for you to sustain sitting through family at a family meal um, where you need to get up and excuse yourself, it's too noisy, and go into the other room. You might need help getting into the other room. Um, that's why I'm talking about like going driving, going to a doctor appointment, going grocery shopping. Um, and then, of course, decrease in cognitive ability. Not always, but oftentimes, um, patients, um, their mentation, their orientation changes because their electrolytes and whatnot gets off course and it affects their um, confusion level and ability to make decisions, which takes me back to talking about that advanced care planning. Whether you're a palliative patient, a hospice patient, or you're just you know moving along in years um, in life, it's always good to do a, advanced care planning and a pulse because that, like I said, it, it relieves your family and loved ones and your physician of what your wishes are and you can always change the, your choices down the road. Another item for, um, for hospice appropriateness is comorbidities. And what does that mean, comorbidities? Comorbidities are other diagnoses that you have besides your primary diagnosis. So you can have come on services for one thing, let's just say lung cancer, and then you can have several other comorbidities that play into that. Maybe you're also a diabetic. You could have high blood pressure. Um, you could have history of having had a stroke. You can have had all these other different things happening in your life prior, and we add those on to your overall um, medical history that helps build the case of whether you're appropriate for hospice services or not. Okay, my screen is blank. Oh, there we go. It's going on to diagnose. Hang on, hang on just a minute. Okay. It's all done. Um, some of the other diagnoses that can be for hospice eligibility, uh, like I was saying, we have Alzheimer's, ALS, 
cancer diagnoses, uh, cerebral vascular accidents like a stroke or in a coma, um, heart disease, congestive heart failure, HIV disease, Huntington's disease, liver disease, lung disease, COPD, multiple sclerosis, uh, muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's disease, renal failure, chronic renal failure. Now, some of these diseases you might think, well, why are they hospice diagnoses? Well, because as you get past that being a serious or chronic illness into that part where treatment is no longer effective, let's just say for possibly a Parkinson's disease or a COPD um, or heart disease for that matter, where no longer treatment is effective, then it's time to say, wow, what do I want in life? And I want to have quality of life and comfort. So that would make you appropriate with all your other comorbidities that we would get from your medical records that would say, yes, you are a good candidate for hospice services. Okay, signs and symptoms, what they can include. I've talked about pain already. That's always a big one because hospice staff, hospice nurses, which I am one of, um, we're known for being experts in pain management. That's one of the number one things that people often come to us for is uncontrolled pain or increased pain. So what we do is we work with you and, the and your family and caregivers and your physician, of course, and our medical director, and we work on your pain control. Um, you could have increased dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing. You could have increased dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, which can affect eating food or drinking. You could have progressive edema, which is swelling. It could be swelling in your ankles. It could be swelling in your hands. It can be swelling all over your body. Um, uncontrolled nausea and vomiting, that can affect your eating, not eating. Uh, it can affect weight loss. Um, depending on medicines you're on, it can, it can be affected. Medicines can cause the nausea and vomiting. Um, and in that, it goes to the bottom one, but the progressive or sudden weight loss, that definitely goes with weight loss or weight gain for that matter, depending on some medications, but not necessarily the good kind of weight gain. Uh, you could be oxygen dependent. That's something we do look at for hospice appropriateness. Um, you don't have to be oxygen dependent though, but that could be one of the things, one of the items. Who may be eligible for our care? Okay, then we still have progressive renal insufficiency. We often have patients that have had um, dialysis. They've had, you know, end stage renal disease and they go on to dialysis. And then they get to the point where they start to other parts of their body and, and diseases are starting to take over and the dialysis is not as effective and they're ready to stop dialysis and they want quality of life. So that's a perfect candidate for hospice services. Frequent infections, that's something else that can be looked at. Frequent hospitalizations, as I mentioned earlier. Um, withdrawn, confused, or bed bound. Um, when that happens, we, we always, like I said, we have to look at the medical record to see what else is going on besides just somebody calling in saying that they want services because the patient's confused and bed bound. That could be as simple as somebody having a, a bladder infection, but that doesn't mean that that's the only thing. They might have other illnesses going on, which would make them appropriate for our services. And yes, we could still treat the bladder infection. It doesn't mean they wouldn't be bed bound anymore, but we could still treat that bladder infection if they were, if that was a symptom. Um, a profound weakness and fatigue, that's very common to happen with um, the terminal patients as the disease progresses towards the end of life, regardless of what disease it is, that is part of the natural progression. Uh, and then progressive decline in spite of cur curative medical therapies. That's exactly what we do with hospices. When people get to where they're, they've tried and they've tried and they've tried and they're not getting the results they want or it's just making them too exhausted to receive the, the traditional curative type medical therapies. They're just, what I always say is they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. They just want to be basically kind of left alone and be comfortable. A lot of times that also means reducing other medications that they don't need. We do this of course with the direction of our physicians or their, the patient's physicians. The hospice circle of care, like I said, it includes a, an RN, um, a social worker, our medical director, and, and of course, your attending physician. Um, it can include a hospice aide if that, when that time comes along that you feel that we need, you need additional help with your personal daily needs. We involve a hospice aide. We can have the dietitian involved. Um, we have a chaplain, and we also have a volunteer. And the volunteer, you know, some of these services don't get accessed for all, all clients, but it just depends on what's happening with you and your family dynamics. But that is our hospice circle of care. Now, where can hospice be provided? We go anywhere that you are. It can be in a private residence. It can be in a skilled nursing facility. 
It can be at a retirement community. Um, we also have our Alexander Cohen Hospice House, which is an inpatient. So if our patients have transferred from the hospital to become a hospice patient, if they're our inpatient, they become a hospice patient. And then of course we can go to the hospital. Um, and then usually, you know, depending on what's happening at the hospital, we can either get you back home or to whatever your place of residence was prior to your hospitalization. Who pays for hospice? Well, you've probably heard of the hospice Medicare benefit. So number one is, hospice, is Medicare. We have, they have a hospice clause in the Medicare benefit. So that's one of the ways that we, are, we get funded. There's the Medi-Cal hospice benefit, which is slightly different. There's private insurances and commercial insurances. There's the VA, veteran benefits, which many people have that. There's fundraising, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, and then there's organizational resources for indigent patients, which is really wonderful. So anybody in the community, if they qualify for the services, they may have their services and they, would, they should not be turned down. Some of the myths about hospice. You can no longer see your physician. That is not correct. You can still continue to see your physician. Um, we work with your physician and your select specialist to work on an individualized plan of care for you. Patients can continue to seek advice from their physician or treatment if, if it's not related to their hospice diagnosis. Um, my main thing is always telling the patient and family, just always communicate with your nurse and social worker of what you're doing if you're going to hospital vi uh, doctor visits or any type of treatments or procedures so that we're involved with that in regards to that because we would not want you to receive a bill for something that you didn't realize you were responsible for and not the hospice agency. Then this takes us to the, the patient cannot go to the hospital. That's another myth. Yes, patients can go to the hospital, um, but the majority of people on hospice want to stay home and don't, they don't want to go to the hospital anymore and they'd rather be home than be in the hospital. Um, but you always have the right to seek treatment in the hospital setting. Um, if you decided to go to the hospital for treatments or, or um, any kind of diagnostic studies, you can always go off hospice services and then request to come back on services later. Say you wanted to get something tested, you wanted to know the results of it, and you wanted to be treated for it. If it's related to your hospice diagnosis, then you would want to go off services, let your regular insurance pick that up the way it normally would, and then when you're done receiving that curative type treatment, whatever that may be, then you would call us and we would get you signed back up onto hospice services. Um, a lot of people also think that you have to have a do not resuscitate order to become on our services. That is not correct. Um, each person can choose between a, to be, have CPR or a do, DNR, which means do not resuscitate order. Our goal is to provide education along your disease process of what's happening and what the outcome may or may not be, depending on what your choices are. And of course, providing emotional support um, to empower our patients and families to make the right decision. So it never hurts to always ask questions when you're doing things. Say you're looking at doing an advanced directive, whether you're on the palliative program or a hospice program, but you're wanting to just get started with that. You need to ask questions, write questions down, ask your doctor. Um, like I said, you can make changes on it, but you wanna make sure that you're making the right decision when you're filling out those documents or when you're talking to your hospice staff when they come to get you admitted to services that you know what it is that you do and don't want. So then that way, then we continue to follow through with your goals. And there we go. Okay, thank you, Christine. So we have a lot of questions and I actually have questions too. So I've been at putting them down here. So at this time, I'm gonna invite everybody um, that's a really brief synopsis um, as it can get very elaborate on these topics. But we're gonna start at the beginning because we have some outstanding questions. So let's start here with, um, let's see here. And I apologize, my button here is being a little bit fickle. Okay, so for someone who is not using um, palliative or hospice support, is advanced care planning important? And what would be the steps to getting started? Good question. Yes, advanced care planning, I believe, is very important. I have done it myself, and I'm not a hospice or a palliative patient. I work for both, but, I'm, I, but I, I do have my advanced directive done. I think it's important because, it, like I said, it gets you um, 
it, it lets your families know. And the question was asking, how do you get started? Um, well, I know you can always call our office and we can assist with things. Right, Kristen? I, we can, you can always call community hospice. I'm sure Memorial will also assist with that. So that would be one thing. And then if you get the document, then of course I, was, I would strongly recommend that you read, read through it, ask some questions and talk to your physician about that. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. And yes, Community Hospice does have resources to help you with advanced care planning, um, as well as um, our local community Department of Aging, and um, there's a lot of other online resources that are available. From what I've been told, anyone over the age of 18 um, should look into uh, advanced care planning. Uh, the next question is, do you say that palliative care is covered by Medicare? Excellent question. No, unfortunately, Medicare does not cover palliative care at this time. Because I've done this for many, many years, um, back in the 80s, Medicare got on board and said, oh, we know that, palliative, or that hospice care is doing a wonderful service. So then it went to legislation and we have what we call the hospice Medicare benefit. And so since then, over that was like in 1986, I believe. Um, and since then, all just about all insurance companies have joined on that bandwagon and said if the government's doing it we want to do it and they want to be a part of it so it's usually not an issue for people to get onto hospice services with their insurances with met with palliative care they their palliative care has been around for about 20 years inpatient in the hospitals but not outpatient for home based like community hospices so right at this moment for community hospice we are working with different agencies um, providers insurance providers to have contracts but right at the moment, it's not through legislation for Medicare to have a palliative care clause. Once it does, I believe it's coming within the next year or so, hopefully sooner than later. But once it does, I believe the same thing will happen as what's happened with hospice is all the other insurances are going to, that are already involved with us, because we do have some that are involved with us, are going to say, we want that too, because our patients need that and they'll see the purpose of what, what uh, good work we can do with, the, with their clients. Thank you, Christine. And the next question is, what would the services look like for a palliative care patient? Like a day on the services of palliative care. What, what is entailed in that? Okay. A day on the services for palliative care. Um, and I give you points of reference with the two of hospice and palliatives, just so you understand the difference. With palliative care, you get signed on services. And so your first visit, you are seeing an RN and a social worker and you get sign up on form, you know, sign forms for your to have on services. And then, um, and of course, the nurse does a full assessment and the social worker does. And then after that, depending on what your needs are, we usually see the patient about two times a month, two visits a month, and about two phone calls a month. However, if there's other things that come up, we're not going to leave them unattended and say, oh, well, we've already seen you. You'll have to wait till next month. But that's just an average of how that works. They are provided with our phone number and my phone number to call at any time. And um, we do not we do not provide the hospice aid at this point um, because there's just not a need. The palliative patients are usually, like I said, they're, they're ambulatory. They're able to get out and take care of themselves and go and do errands and whatnot, and doctor appointments. Thank you. Okay, the next question is, in a typical week, under normal circumstances, how many visits would a patient receive in palliative care? And maybe you can address that also for hospice. How many okay. times a week would they see um, an actual person in their home? Okay, so for for hospice, we get, of course we have our Medicare guidelines, and we treat all patients through those Medicare guidelines. For hospice patients, they would see a, a nurse a minimum of one time a week. They would see a social work a social worker a minimum of one time a month. With uh, and then they they add more services based on what your needs are, meaning a hospice aide. Um, a dietitian, if you needed a consult, the chaplain, if you requested that, and we go from the end, of course, then if you needed wound care, we would do wound care during the week, depending on what kind of wounds you had, it would depend on the frequency. So it could be one, two, three times a week, you would see nursing visits based on what your individual needs were. Now with palliative, because you're, we're just one of the parties that come in, we're not all inclusive like hospice, with palliative care, you could, typically you could go a week with no visits at all from a palliative team member. Now that doesn't mean that you can't call and see and say that you have a need or an issue or something's come up. You can, and if you need a visit, then we'll make a visit. But relatively, it would be maybe this one week you did the admission with the nurse and the social worker, 
And then in about two weeks, you would get a phone call. Then about a week after that, you would see probably the nurse. Then depending on what you'd see the social worker, but it averages out to about two, two visits a month and two or more phone calls a month. But like I said, we individualize that based on what your needs are. The frequency is less than it is with hospice because we know you're involved with other agencies that also are making visits and you're also going to doctor appointments where pallet hospice patients are generally staying home most of, almost all the time. And so, their disease progression is much more rapid. So you mentioned that hospice patients stay home most of the time. Um, and I think we can agree that, um, and there's a little feedback, can you mute here? Um, so we can agree that um, we're, uh, they're not caregivers. So who is the primary caregiver for somebody who's on hospice or somebody who's on palliative care? And what do they do in the interim if there is a change of condition or if they have questions or concerns and that staff member is not there? Good question. So for both palliative and hospice patients, if they, you know, when we are, when we're doing poorly in our health advances and declines, we don't come with a book that says to give to somebody of how to be a caregiver to us. So that's a lot of what the team does for palliative and for hospice is we provide education and we identify usually on the first visit who will be your caregiver. That gets talked about right away with hospice on the first visit. With palliative, the caregiver isn't always around on the first visit, but during time we find out who is your, going to be your caregiver. Is it going to be your significant other? Is it going to be a child, an adult child? Is it going to be hired caregivers? Um, and it can go the same direction with the hospice patient. We help you identify who your caregiver is and who you want it to be. And then we help work on teaching them what they need to know to give care to, the, to their loved one at home. Did I answer that, all of that? Okay. Um, and, and, and to further add on to that, to further add on to that, um, with palliative care, does a palliative care patient have to have a caregiver? That's another good question. Palliative care. Um, for, the, for the palliative care patient, no, they don't have to have a caregiver to begin with. And they don't have to have a caregiver just to come on to services. However, when we start to see the decline with the patient or they, the patient starts to bring up their decline, we do address that because for the most part, we know that as their disease continues, they're not gonna be able to remain home alone or in their place of residence alone. But it's not a requirement to come on to services for palliative care. Do you ever have patients on palliative or hospice care that improve? Uh, maybe their disease process doesn't decline, but they improve? I love that question. Yes, for both programs, we have people that, that improve. Um, the palliative patients, when they improve, it's, they've been on services for a time and they, we've stabilized them out. They've been, we've done a lot of teaching with them. They understand the importance of going to their, all their doctor appointments and their specialists and their medications and being con, um, consistent with taking their medications. With the hospice patients, and so yes, they, when we stabilize them out, we, then we discharge them, of course. They, we've given them a lot of tools and on they go. With the hospice patients, yes, of course, and we call that they graduate from hospice services. When they graduate, what that means is it doesn't mean that maybe they still don't have, uh, they, that their diagnosis changed, say of a lung cancer diagnosis or a, some sort of a, whatever, a cardiac diagnosis. Um, but it means that we've gotten them very stable. Their pain is under control. Their symptoms are under control. Um, and maybe they have other plans to go, to go do other things and they, they've just improved. They've really stabilized out. And so we call that graduating. They can always come back to our services. So yes, they do graduate it. And it happens more often than not. That's wonderful news. Um, okay, so a couple of additional questions. Um, Ms. Pitts asked, is there a limit to the amount of time a patient can be on palliative care? And maybe you can also address that for hospice. Um, time frames. So with hospice patients, they have, like I said, you have to have one of the, recommend, the criteria for hospice is to have a prognosis of six months of life or less. But if you live past the six months and you still qualify, you can continue on services. 
we have had some patients on services for a very, very long time because they continue to be appropriate. Like I said earlier, the RN or the LVN that make the visit, every time they make a nursing visit, they are assessing that patient's level of care, their symptoms, their pain management, their medications, all of, their, all of the things that's going on with their entire body of whether they still qualify. Time frame for palliative. Once again, because palliative is not with, we do not have regulations yet. We have practice of standards, standards of practice, but we don't have regulations say with Medicare that we don't have that in regards to a time frame. And because it's life, um, it's serious illness is not a terminal illness. There is not been a, a, a cutoff date for the palliative patients to say, you have to graduate off of our services. It just is individualized based on how they're doing. Okay, and um, let's see here. So I know that um, there can be a lot of misconceptions about when is the right time to call for hospice services. And um, some may think that it's really just for like the last days of life. Can you provide some clarity in regards to when someone um, would really benefit from hospice services um, or palliative services and um, how it can enhance quality of life? Yes, um, one of the things, unfortunately, with all my years of doing hospice care, palliative work, is people are referred to hospice services too late, too late, way too long into the process of the person's illness. It's much preferred for the behalf of the patient and their family, if you think someone is doing poorly or that they have a terminal illness, yeah, or they have a terminal illness and you just are wondering if they qualify for hospice, it's better that you call the hospice agency and ask for us to come out and assess the patient and we would tell you if the patient is appropriate or not. Because what happens otherwise is people wait and wait and wait until the very last and they get hospice services for the last couple of days of life, last couple hours. I mean, it can, it can be very, very short and they always say to us, we wish we'd had hospice sooner. And we do too, because then we can teach you how to do the things you need to do to provide care. Is it also about Christine, what would be the best way for somebody if they saw their loved one start to decline or they had questions or they wanted to explore further palliative care or even hospice, what would their approach be? Um, can they call directly or should they contact a doctor? What would you recommend? Um, if you have questions, I answer questions all day long. You can always call our agency for any questions, either palliative or, or hospice services, and give you answers in regards to helping you with the direction. We also have had people in the past, you know, come in and just uh, have a consult. You can have one of our staff come and do a consult. But questions are always welcome over the phone. There's other agencies too. Um, questions, no question is silly. You can always make, make a call and ask. Um, it's better to ask ahead of time than right at the end when things start to become urgent and in a crisis mode. When it's not crisis mode, everybody is a lot calmer and it, it flows much easier for you and your loved one. So do you have to have a doctor's referral or can you call yourself? No, you, you do not have to have a doctor's referral to, to become, to join up for hospice or palliative care. That is our role. So say, say your spouse called for hospice services for you or, or did a neighbor call because they saw you were doing poorly. You can, that can happen. And then it's our, at our end, we take care of notifying the physician and getting your medical records and then connecting with you and then the physician in regards to the appropriateness for hospice services. For palliative services, the same thing. We work with the insurances, but also with your physician. So a lot of people call me directly and ask, do I qualify for palliative care? So phone calls are always welcome to the agency for any kind of questions or for um, eligibility for either program. Okay, and I know another misconception um, has to do with, um, I know what we hear frequently is, is um, that people have this perception that when we come in, we stop all their medications and, um, so I guess the question is, is that when somebody comes on to palliative care or even hospice care, can a person continue to take medications and can they see their doctors anymore? 
that, that question is asked a lot. So let's start with palliative care. Yes, the, the people can, when they come on services, they, they continue to take their medications. If they're choosing to stop some of them, we still have to get a doctor's order to discontinue any of their medications. But for the most part, we, we ask what they're taking and continue on with that and help do any planning with them and educating. Same with hospice patients. If they want to continue on with their medications, absolutely they can take their medications. But what generally happens with the patients that are on hospice services is their disease progresses, things start to slow down and, and they get tired and they're not eating. And so one by one, we start to make arrangements make decisions of uh, discontinuing some meds or suggestions. And then it still comes down to whatever the patient and the family want and what the ability is of the patient to continue taking those medications. So I, I think what I'm hearing and is safe to say is that patients still have right to choose their plans of care and continue medications that they feel is necessary. Um, as long as it's medically appropriate, is that right? Right, and thank you for saying that, the patient's rights, because that's exactly it. It's the patient's rights to continue with their medications and what they want to take or not take. We're just there as a guide to educate families and, and the patients of what their choices are. Uh, okay, wonderful. And it looks like I have another question. And again, just to clarify, um, so a patient, does a patient need a doctor's referral to start hospice? Can they self-refer? And the same for palliative care. That's another question was just answered or asked, as well as a, a nice comment that says, thanks for the excellent presentation. Very welcome. Do, do I need to repeat that answer to that one? Yeah. Let me, I'll go. I'll go ahead and repeat the answer in regards to the question came up again about self-referral or do you need a physician? No, you do not need a physician referral to, to make a referral for hospice or palliative. You can call yourself and ask questions or make the referral. It's at our end then, if it didn't come from a physician, that we take the ball and roll with it and connect with your physician to get your medical records and go from there. So I do need a doctor's order and the approval of my medical director for you to be so two doctors for you to get signed up on our hospice services with palliative I need the medical records from your physician and then I review with my medical director and we get you signed up on services. So the process is a little bit different, but both can be a self-referral. So we take care of all of that on the back end or whatever hospice provider, they would take care of that on the back end. Um, anyone can Absolutely. call and inquire. Absolutely, yes. Calls are always welcome. Lovely. And um, I just wanna open it up if there's any additional questions. And um, now would be to the time to ask. I'll give it just a second here. Um, at this time, we'd also like to invite you to our next Came for the Caregiver event, which is how to find your center, um, which I think we can all work on finding our center during this public health crisis. But that event will be on October the 8th at 11 o'clock, um, same format through webinar, and the registration link is provided here on your screen. Um, we will send out an email to everybody who attended today um, with some information as to where you can view this um, presentation again and include that link in, in the email. So if there's no additional questions, which I don't see at this time, Christine, I'd like to thank you for your time and for your expertise. You're welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. And we'd like to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.